Thank you for coming. As I'm sure you realise, this, um, this session is being broadcast. I just uh, point that out for the benefit of all of those taking part. We've got about an hour for this uh, question and answer session, which I'm sure will develop more into a discussion. Um, and we're most grateful to both of you for taking part in this. This is the second evidence session that we have had on this particular inquiry on the accountability of civil servants. The first one, which was just before the most recent recess that we had, the Jubilee recess, uh, we talked to the chairman of select committees in the House of Commons. And we wanted now, really, to turn the focus, if we may, to, to experienced secretaries of state, and particularly those who had had the uh, responsibility for very large departments. Um, and I will obviously, as I said, invite any member of the committee to pick up any of the points which I think have been circulated to you, but I'm sure this will be, as I said, a very free-flowing discussion. It would be very helpful for the purposes of the, uh, the broadcasting and the report if you could slightly, I think, excessively in both your cases, just identify yourselves, if you would, when you first speak. Um, we, if I may, I think I will plunge straight in, because it's something which has come up in all of our discussions, and ask whether you think that the conventions, as everyone has understood them, of ministerial responsibility can continue to be relevant in the most modern forms of government, and particularly whether the expansion of government activity, and particularly, I think, I suppose, in both of your cases, a department like the Home Office, which has, has very, very broad responsibilities and responsibilities for bodies which are only quasi-government activity, quasi-government quasi organisations, um, is, makes the, really the understanding of ministerial responsibility in the individual sense to Parliament one that we can continue to exercise, and if, if we can't, what should replace it? Perhaps Lord Howard would start. I'm Lord Howard of Lim. Um, my answer to your question is, broadly speaking, yes. There are a couple of caveats and qualifications. And I think it would be helpful, and I suggest this somewhat diffidently, um, if one thought a little bit about what you actually mean by the phrase ministerial responsibility. Mm. I was struck reading the minutes of your proceedings on the 23rd of May by the extent to which the word accountability and the word responsibility, those two words were used pretty well interchangeably as though they meant the same thing. I don't think they do mean the same thing. So that I think that ministers should be accountable to Parliament and Parliament select committees, obviously, for everything that is within the remit of their department. But there will be some things within the remit of their department for which they are not responsible Accountable to Parliament, yes, but not responsible. For example, there will be things which have been devolved to um, independent bodies, come within the broad remit of the Department. So they should still be accountable to Parliament for those things, but they're not responsible for them. And another example, which you did indeed discuss on the 23rd of May, and which I'm sure is um, in everyone's minds is leading to complications when it comes to accountability, is the kind of project which extends over a significant period of time, started when there was a different minister in charge of the department, when there was a different permanent secretary, um, implemented or not implemented under a second secretary of state and a second permanent secretary, and yet the person who is accountable, properly accountable to parliament, for that project is the minister who happens to be in charge of the department at the point of inquiry. Now, I think it's perfectly proper that he should be accountable, but he's not in any way, any meaningful way, responsible for the way in which the project was designed or drawn up at its outset, or for any critical mistakes which may have been made under a predecessor Secretary of State and a predecessor permanent secretary. So I think that if one was a bit clearer 
about the difference between accountability and responsibility, it would help in, in the clarity of thinking on these issues. That's extremely, extremely interesting, but if I may, and I will obviously come to you in a minute, Mr Clark, but if I may just ask you, Lord Howard, if you talk about the collective responsibility, for example, of the Cabinet, that is also collectively accountable to Parliament, isn't it? Yeah, collective responsibility, I think, means something slightly different. Collective responsibility means that you, um, you, you accept responsibility for the decisions and acts of your colleagues, and you don't um, take a different line in public. But if we emphasise the responsibility as opposed to the collective, that we talk about responsibility as well as accountability in that context. I think that's, uh, well, I, as I say, I think that's a slightly different concept, and I think collective responsibility sums that up fairly accurately. Mr Clark. Uh, my name is Charles Clark. I agree uh, with most of what uh, Michael Howard just had to say. Um, two preliminary remarks. One, I'm broadly conservative about the existing structures. I'm not in favour of dramatic change in them. That perhaps is fitting in somebody who's the son of a former permanent secretary. Uh, <laughs> but I uh, am not, not in favour of m much of the discussion which is going on about tearing up the current system. Secondly, I think in the set of questions that you've established... There's an element which you uh, don't reflect, perhaps understandably you can't, which is the politics of the time in relation to all these issues when they in practice arise. Um, I think that trying to codify what you've called the Convention of Individual Ministerial Responsibility is an interesting task, uh, one I think you'll find as a committee quite elusive, actually. I'm not at all sure what, quotes the Convention of Individual Ministerial Responsibility is, I think Michael's discourse on the relationship between responsibility and accountability is helpful and true. I think where I probably disagree with what he said is I think the Queen's government has to keep going perpetually, and that's why the system of accountability uh, has to be perpetual. And though you have changes of personnel, whether minister or permanent secretary or whatever, the accountable system has to be that the government is accountable to Parliament, is accountable to the country. Now, you can argue how that process works and how well it works at each stage, but to start saying there's a moment that simply is a change of, even change of government, but certainly a change of uh, Cabinet member or change of Permanent Secretary, which there's a discontinuity in that accountability, I think leads to potentially quite dangerous situations where people start saying it's their fault, not my fault. Uh, and going back to the political point, on many of these issues... You've got a blame culture, uh, chase the victim uh, process that gets going, uh, which I think is profoundly unhelpful. I think the, the principle of ministerial responsibility for what the government does is absolutely correct and is very important. So, as I say, I'm broadly conservative in this. I think keeping the existing conventions is the right way to go. I think codifying them is, is, is quite difficult, and as I say, I think you'll find elusive. But I think you, it's very, very difficult to ignore the political pressures of the moment in relation to any particular case when anybody's looking to see what happened when, to see who, who left office, who didn't, or whatever, in any given circumstance. And I think the final point is, I think the accounting officer, being the permanent secretary, accountable to the Public Accounts Committee, is a very important principle and is a distinction when you talk about the accountability-responsibility relationship, which Michael described, between the minister and the permanent secretary. I've always said myself that the core relationship for a Secretary of State is with the permanent secretary in that department to get the relationships right. Where that goes wrong, and we can give lots of examples, then the whole structure of government tends to fall down. Where it is right, then you can conduct government in a proper way. And getting that relationship right is terribly important and relates to your later questions about accountability of permanent secretaries and change of permanent secretaries and so on, which is a very difficult question. And it also leads to the question of um, ministerial involvement and appointments. Uh, Lord, uh, did you want to weigh Lord Macdonald? Yeah, I wonder whether you think that, that ministers should be able to exercise any influence over civil service appointment. And, and, and as a supplementary, Mr Clark, whether you think there are particular posts that such a process... Yeah might be more desirable. Well, self-evidently, they do. The Prime Minister, through the Cabinet Secretary, directly influences the appointment of permanent secretaries across government. I think correctly so. I mean, obviously, most importantly, the Cabinet Secretary directly, or the head of the civil service, where they're different posts. But then when key, um, uh, key permanent secretaries are appointed, the Prime Minister's consulted. Uh, 
I used to be of the view that individual cabinet members shouldn't be involved in that process. Um, and that really is my view, I think. But I'm being hypocritical in saying so, since in my own case, uh, I lost confidence in John Geeve, who was the Permanent Secretary of the Home Office when I became Home Secretary. And I felt, and I said to the then Secretary of the Cabinet and Prime Minister, that I thought he should move. Um, and uh, I also had views about who would be the best person to replace him. So I did put yeah. those views, but I put them to the Prime Minister and to the Secretary of the Cabinet. Uh, and I don't actually think that a minister should directly appoint their permanent secretary. But I do think that there should be more uh, accountability of the permanent secretaries than there often is at the moment. Isn't that a slightly cosmetic distinction? I mean, I'm not arguing against it at all, but, yeah. but I mean, there's absolutely no point a minister having foisted on him a permanent secretary that, that he or she can't work with, and we all know that's happened um, from time to time. So, so, the, so, so the, the, the minister's input to the prime minister's view is going to be highly significant, isn't it? Not in my case. It, it didn't affect things for a very long time. Uh, unfortunately, from my point of view. Uh, but there we are, that's life. Um, and uh, the, uh, the fact is that uh, it is a cosmetic distinction, I take your point, but it's certainly not the case. The Prime Minister will automatically do whatever their Cabinet member thinks, uh, still less that the Secretary of the Cabinet will automatically want to do even what the Prime Minister wants, let alone mm. what an individual Cabinet member would want. Nor do I really believe that you can be in a situation where when a minister comes into office, a secretary of state comes into office, they then appoint their permanent secretary. I think that would be a very, very dangerous course of action indeed, and I'm not in favour of that at all. But as I say, I'm slightly aware of my own hypocrisy in the way I'm describing this, because it is the case that my own relationships didn't work out as I would have wished them do you to think, do. Do you think there are particular posts that, that might require more direct ministerial involvement? No, not really. Uh, I, uh, I mean, the, the classic ones would be the great departments of states, the Treasury, the Foreign Office, the Home Office. But I don't think they're, in principle, so different from the other great, great departments. Can I just ask the Nettle and ask you whether you think the diff different rules ought to apply to the uh, appointment of the DPP, which is a permanent secretary appointment? Uh, I'm, I'm ready to answer that question, but not with a great deal of familiarity. I've never been involved in the appointment of a DPP, um, and I don't know enough about how it uh, operates. I'm not clear. Uh, I, I think this relationship between politics and the law has become clarified over recent years with the Supreme Court and so on. But I'm not at all sure that you should say that the DPP is a role that's completely independent of the political process. And I'm inclined to think that the DPP should be appointed uh, through the political, uh, under the supervision of the political process with the Prime Minister and, and in the Permanent Secretary structure. But I say that with some hesitation since I've not thought about yeah. that particular question. I mean, we have this time. distinction that the, the Attorney General is a, is a superintending Indeed. Minister of the DPP rather than a directing Minister, which is clearly a significant difference. It is a significant difference. I mean, Michael, with respect, I think could probably answer your yeah. question better than I can, but um, I think that the idea that you could have a separately legally appointed approach, nothing to do with the political process, I think, doesn't really work. Mm. Mr. Lord Howard, do you want to? Uh, yes. Um, I'm certainly not in favour of any move towards anything rem remotely resembling the American system, whereby um, an incoming administration um, changes large swathes of um, what we would regard as civil service positions, which I think is a very unhelpful process indeed. I don't know what the current situation is or what it was under the last government. When I was last in government, the position was that a minister had um, pretty wide discretion over the appointment of people in his private office. Um, so you, you saw several candidates and you actually made the choice as to who was to be your principal private secretary and so on. And in my time, had a kind of unofficial right of veto over the appointment of a new permanent secretary, um, which I exercised. Um, so I, um, you didn't have the right to choose your per permanent secretary, although in the end I did actually get the person I wanted, but I didn't say I insist on having X. But what I said was, um, I don't want a new permanent secretary because I'm trying to completely change the culture of the Home Office. I don't want a new permanent secretary who has at any point in his career served in the Home Office. Um, and the candidate that the that officialdom had lined up had spent a large part of his career in the Home Office. I have nothing at all against him personally. 
um, but I said, I'm afraid I, I want someone different. And that led to quite a prolonged um, argument, I suppose is one word for it, <laughs> involving the Cabinet Secretary um, and ultimately the Prime Minister, and ultimately the Prime Minister resolved it in my favour. I think the unofficial veto, which Michael describes as a good description of what the situation was, when I look at appointments in the Home Office below the level of Permanent Secretary, I was directly engaged in that process um, at the senior Deputy Secretary levels, including ones which were very difficult indeed. Uh, running the Border Service, for example, was a massive uh, difficulty appointment where we couldn't find anybody in the whole of the civil service who we could appoint to that job. And finally, we appointed somebody who was a local authority chief executive. Um, and it was a very difficult process. But certainly, the Secretary of State was directly involved. Um, I don't know how proper that was, in a sense. As far as I know, it was proper, but uh, it's, uh, there was a direct involvement. And I'm very much in agreement with Michael's point that if you are suddenly become a Home Secretary or head of a department, you are concerned about the whole culture of the organisation, the way it works, the way it operates. And whether you have an arbitrary rule such as nobody's been in the department before, as Michael described, or a more ad hominem rule about whether you think the people are ready to make these changes is a very important issue. Lord Hart, did you want to come in on that? No, it was just I, the description that we've just heard, I believe, is still the position. Um, that is to say, uh, not a right of selection, but a right of veto. I wouldn't say it's a right of veto. Well, not a right of veto. I think uh, the, the, the phrase that Michael used was the right one. And, of course, at the other end, uh, uh, of, apart from appointment, what about disciplinary proceedings? Lord Howard, disciplinary proceedings vis-à-vis -vis the civil service? No, I don't think ministers... It's immensely frustrating. Mm. Um, but I don't think ministers should have a role in that. Um, I don't want to take up too much of the committee's time. Uh, but if I can give you an example of just how frustrating it can be. Please do. Quite early in my tenure as Home Secretary, um, a rather sensitive document was leaked. And uh, a, a, a leak inquiry was instituted. Famously successful. Uh, well, let me tell you exactly <laughs> what happened. <laughs> the, the person in charge of the leak inquiry concluded as follows. Um, I've... I've um, made inquiries of everyone who had access to this document. I've established that um, only two people um, had access to the document at the relevant time, only two officials had access to the document at the relevant time. Um, one gave me a totally convincing uh, account of the way in which he had handled the document, um, and uh, I therefore didn't question him further. Um, the other uh, admitted that he'd had the document at the relevant time, admitted um, that he'd uh, spoken to the journalist who wrote the article at the relevant time, um, but denied um, categorically that he had told the journalist about the <laughs> contents of the document. I am therefore unable to come to a conclusion about who was responsible for the leak. So um, that's an example of just how frustrating it can be. But nevertheless, I don't think ministers should have a role in, uh, in dismissal or, in, or disciplinary uh, proceedings. Lord Panic. About that. I mean, why is it inappropriate for the minister in that type of situation to make representations to say the permanent secretary as to whether consideration should be given to disciplinary proceedings? That's quite different from actually disciplinary. Yes, proceedings. that is different. Uh, I mean, I think. But you would accept it would be permissible for the minister to, to yeah, take it would that be, step. It would be. Uh, Ministers can make representations to their permanent secretaries and do all the time about all sorts of things. The question is, um, who is to have the decision yeah, yeah. Uh, responsibility? Who is to be responsible for making the decision? On appointment, as it were. Lady Joe, can I just make one other point that follows on what Michael said, which is that I think there's a triumvirate in a department which is very important, which is the Secretary of State, the Permanent Secretary, and the prim Principal Private Secretary to the uh, Secretary of State. That triumvirate is very, very important. Um, in fact, in both cases, when I became Secretary of State, I inherited a principal private secretary with whom I was very happy. But when a new appointment came along some considerable time after I became um, uh, Secretary of State, I was then directly involved in the way Michael describes in the appointment of the new person. But that person has an absolutely massive responsibility in ensuring that the relationship between the Secretary of State and the um, permanent secretary is harmonious in all these respects. So the kind of 
point and the that, rest of the department. And indeed, the rest. Forgive of, me. Uh, I, I completely agree. And the kind of point that Lord Panic made need not necessarily be done by a direct representation from the Secretary of State to the uh, to the Permanent Secretary. Uh, the principal private secretary, worth his or her salt, would know the problem what, that was in the mind of the Secretary of State and would be talking to the Permanent Secretary about it to try and resolve it in a successful way. So it might not might well not come to a meeting at which a representation is made. But I think that triumvirate is a very, very important... That, that principal private secretary has to have the responsibility... has to have the confidence of both the Secretary of State and the Permanent Secretary. Can we turn, uh, perhaps, from the civil servants' relationship with uh, the civil the Secretaries of State in terms of the Secretary of State's responsibility for them and to their impact on ministers, Lord Shaw? Yes. Uh, clearly, uh, civil servants come into contact with the public or the parliament so much more than they, they did do it. So that's my opinion. Uh, to what extent does the Home Civil Service, for example, act as a constitutional check on the actions of ministers? For example, should any public statement that has to be made or is asked for from a civil servant only be in accordance with his minister's view? Or what is the position if a minister has yet to give a view on something, yet when questioned, a civil servant, now is he barred from giving his own personal view? What freedom is there in the case of the civil servants? Well, in terms of, uh, in terms of checks, certainly um, there can be a check, and they should to some extent be a check. Um, Again, I can only speak of the position in, in, in terms of what it was um, when I was in government. But, for example, um, if, if there was any question of a press release from the department um, going out, which was considered to step over the mark of, um, into what was into the political arena... Um, I would be told mm -hmm. that, they, that the officials didn't think that was proper and invariably the press release was amended. Um, I think things probably changed somewhat um, after 1997 in that respect. Um, but certainly if that was the case before then and, and they exercised a proper role in ensuring that conventions of that kind were properly adhered to. In terms of what they say, in public or to a select committee or whatever, I think if they're giving evidence on behalf of their minister, which is um, normally what, what the position is, they've got to reflect the views of the minister because it's the minister who is there to decide policy and to uh, make those decisions and the civil servants are there to implement those decisions. I, I don't think things did change after 1997 actually, certainly not in the departments I was associated with. And in answer to your question, I would say the Home Civil Service absolutely does act and should act as a constitutional check on the actions of ministers. I think that is precisely what they ought to do. Everything, however, depends on the relationship between the Permanent Secretary and the Secretary of State. As I said at the outset, the Permanent Secretary has to be strong enough to say to possibly a very strong minister, you can't do this, Secretary of State. And to be honest, I don't think all Permanent Secretaries are strong enough to do that. And so there are occasions when ministers will try and override their permanent secretaries. Uh, and I think that is a serious criticism of the permanent secretary. Um, I, I think, secondly, that the, um, what I used to do, and I would certainly encourage, and I still do in various courses and so on, that when I'm asked to talk about what it is to be a cabinet member, I would ask all civil servants, even as many as around a table this size, to give me their opinion about what I was proposing. And I would say the sanctionable offence would be not to tell me I was going to do something mad uh, before I found out by another route. <laughs> now, it was then my job to take the decision. So if somebody said, actually, you're mad to do this for the following reasons, uh, I would, uh, and I'd say, well, actually, I'm still going to go ahead and be mad. Uh, that was a matter for me, and it was my decision. But it was the duty, I emphasise the duty of the officials, to say to me, you, this, you have to operate in this way and understand these circumstances. Um, and there are other ministers, I understand, who don't operate in that way, who essentially don't want their civil servants to speak up for what their view is, and they don't want to be contradicted. I'm sure Michael um, would have been similar, having the personality he has to the way I was approaching these things, in wanting people to be quite candid about what they were. And I didn't mind if officials said I was doing completely the wrong thing, 
because I was confident enough to deal with the arguments they were putting forward and come to a view about how to proceed. But having said that, you then are in a, seri a series of quite difficult issues. If the civil servants aren't strong, and if in particular the permanent secretary isn't strong, in relationship to their Secretary of State, and that leads to a very difficult set of issues. You used in your question uh, the phrase constitutional check. Now, that becomes a, a very critical question when you're talking about, for example, quasi-judicial roles played by ministers, when you're talking about proprieties, I don't know, for example, in relation to allocation of monies, including to your own constituency, and issues of this kind, where the civil service has to be absolutely a stickler for the, the, the position, and should be. It's one of the reasons I find uh, the current position in relation to the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport completely inexplicable uh, in the current circumstances. It doesn't appear the Permanent Secretary acted yeah. as he, he should have done. Um, but I think it is a constitutional check. It should be a constitutional check. Where it fails to be a constitutional check, it should be a key culture of the civil service to be that constitutional check. Now, there are some politicians who don't like that. We see it in the papers all the time at the moment, certain politicians who argue you don't want civil servants who are a constitutional check. I take exactly the opposite view. I think it's critical they're a constitutional check as long as at the end of the day the right of the minister to take the decision is acknowledged and recognised, which I think in practice is the case. I think all civil servants I know accept that. Uh, if the Secretary of State wants to take a decision, that's what they should do. Yes, but there's a very important distinction to be made between questions of propriety and questions of policy. When it comes to propriety, then um, actually um, the ministers ought to listen to the civil servants who ought to tell them that what they are contemplating doing is improper. Um, and if that isn't said to the minister, that's a failure on the part of the civil servant and that's serious. When it comes to policy, as it happens, uh, I did take the same attitude as, as Charles, and I did like to have uh, different views expressed um, because I thought that helped me to come to uh, better decisions. And, and, and not infrequently, I would be persuaded that what I was contemplating doing um, was not the right thing to do. Um, other ministers take a different approach um, uh, and, and don't like that sort of thing happening, and that's really a matter of the different temperaments of, of different ministers and there's not much you can do about that and uh, that, you know that's just the way life is but I think that's in a completely different box from questions of propriety. Mm -hmm. I, I, do, I do agree with that but I, I also think there are examples, there are examples in the Labour government certainly of ministers, senior ministers who take key policy decisions closely with their special advisers and some friends and weren't ready to allow uh, civil servants to comment on them. And now I agree with Michael that that's their right. It's their, it's not a, 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 there's not something wrong about that. But I do think it's extremely unwise. And I think there are some current ministers who are also doing that. And I th also think it's very unwise. Lord Crick Howell, Lord Panic, and Lady Faulkner all want to come in on this. Lord Crick Howell. I was going, I'm going to ask a, a different question, but I can't resist saying in response to their reference about quasi judicial roles that what a pity it is that those of us who served on the Joint Committee on the Constitution Bill and pressed an amendment very hard against the combined front benches, the then Labour government and the Conservative opposition, that this role should not be given to a minister because they were bound to have a political view and it was an absurd situation. It was defeated, but what a pity it was defeated. And I suspect we will have to move to a situation where ministers aren't put in the position of having to take quasi-judicial roles uh, on such issues. But that, I'm sorry, is just a, a diversion. We were defeated by a very narrow majority. <laughs> pity. Um, I was going to ask, and I'm aware that neither of you have had to serve in coalition governments. But press reports indicate that the civil servants, and that particularly the, the cabinet secretary, is having to play quite a significant role uh, in bringing together the coalition and deciding where things are part of coalition policy and how they should be handled. Indeed, uh, some of us saw a report, I think, in the Times that said that there was actually a cabinet committee had been chaired by uh, the uh, cabinet secretary, which was something which would have been inconceivable in the time when I served in cabinet. I just wonder if you have any comment to make about the relationship of the civil service uh, to a coalition government. 
As you say, um, <clears throat> I've never served in the coalition government, but I think there are two separate points. Point one is that it is true, I know it's a truism, but it is true that um, all governments are, in a sense, coalitions. All governments, including single-party governments, have caucuses and groups within them who work in particular ways, and in a way not entirely uh, dissimilar to having two separate political parties in operation. They're groups who have their own members of parliament who will vote in parliamentary votes in accordance with what's happening and so on. And I think, in a sense, the operation of this coalition government is different to an extent to what's happened in previous one-party governments, but it's not on a completely different planet. I think the difference, however, the second difference is much more significant, which is there is no manifesto. The manifesto has been replaced by the coalition agreement. And the replacement, uh, and I understand why, I don't criticise anybody for replacing it with the coalition agreement, because I don't think there was an alternative in 2010 but to do that. But the coalition agreement has been given um, a kind of authority almost equivalent to a manifesto commitment. And that's not a trivial point when it comes to your Lordship's house in terms of the way in which you can behave in relation to various issues which come along. And I think the constitutional propriety of that is a more difficult and complicated question. Uh, I wasn't aware of the report you've indicated about the role of the Cabinet Secretary in chairing Cabinet committees, but I agree in the government I was a member of it would have been extraordinary. I don't think it happened at all. Um, I may be wrong about that, but I don't think so. And I find it extraordinary because at the end of the day, uh, the political working of the coalition has to be for the political leaders of the coalition, namely the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, to sort out how they make that coalition work. I think Lord, ha Lord, Lord Crickhall would agree with me that um, in the administration in which he served, the whole concept of coalition government would have been inconceivable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I think that um, we have little experience of coalitions, and therefore inevitably, to some extent, um, people are having to make things up as they go along. Now, of course, Charles is right when he says that there are coalitions within parties. But the difference between that and the present situation is that the differences are formalised. You, you have two separate political parties. And therefore, it doesn't strike me as um, astonishing that in some fora you may benefit from an independent voice chairing the particular discussion that is taking place, whether you know, that forum is an informal one or whether it becomes a cabinet committee. Um, I'm not sure matters all that much. We are in uncharted waters. We haven't had a peacetime coalition for 90 years, and even that was a continuation of a wartime coalition. So we are in completely uncharted waters. People are having, to some extent, to make things up as they go along. And um, it, it certainly would have struck me as inconceivable, too, in, in a single-party government that a civil servant even the Cabinet Secretary should have chaired a Cabinet Committee, but times have changed. Lady Faulkner. On a more mundane level, and going back to what you were saying earlier about welcoming um, challenge from civil servants in, in terms of the constitutional checks and so on, and particularly in terms of policy ideas, in a, in a coalition where you would have perhaps the senior minister from one party and the minister responsible for that particular policy area from another party, how would you foresee that challenge from civil servants operating um, through, you know, essentially what we would like to think of as an impartial and neutral civil service? Well, I think you'd have, in the kind of discussion that we've been talking about, officials around the table putting different views on a, an issue that has to be decided, um, you'd have the Secretary of State and the relevant Minister of State sitting side by side, listening to the arguments. They'd listen to the arguments, and then they'd have a discussion between them and resolve it. That's, I imagine, how it would happen. So that I mean, final you, you discussion would be you, bilateral in negotiations? Yes, because, because, the because it, and that's a good yeah. example of what Charles was talking about earlier, because that's how I did it in my time. And having listened to the arguments from the officials, you wouldn't always get the same view of the Secretary of State and the Minister of State. Mm -hmm. But you discuss it between you and you come to a conclusion and that would be the policy. And I, I very much agree with what Michael has just said. Um, but just to add one point, which is that what the civil servants ought to bring to the conversation is uh, an analysis of the facts around the policy decision that you're about being taken 
of the varying positions that come from various areas and so on. And I very often found that when you had a discussion about a particular policy, what you might have thought you might do in the saloon bar is different from what you actually came to do once you considered the arguments when they were really put in a very clear way. Um, and it's why even today I resist saying, well, what do you think about X? Because actually often I will not have considered the fullness of the arguments mm. that you're bound to when you are a responsible Secretary of State. And that process of discussion with the independent civil service brought out a whole set of considerations. Now, you might decide, well, actually, my saloon bar view still remains the right one, but you might say, but I, mean, I hadn't thought of that. I'd better look at it in a different way. And that's very true in the coalition context as well, I would say. I mean, I don't want to make any anti-liberal Democrat remarks, but I think that I sometimes feel their policies in some areas are more dependent on the saloon bar than the main parties, though no doubt that will now change. No panic. Did you want to come in on Yes, but I very briefly, you both emphasised, understandably, how important it is for civil servants to give clear advice to ministers on impropriety uh, and on unconstitutional action. But supposing the minister doesn't accept that advice and the civil service uh, think that the minister is simply wrong, not on a question of policy, but on a question of impropriety or unconstitutional mm -hmm. action, does the civil service just accept that or is there some no. action there, it can take? There is then a formal minute. I can't remember the name of the process, but it happens very rarely, but where the permanent secretary will formally minute, saying he doesn't accept and thinks impropriety has taken place, that would go to the cabinet secretary as well as to the secretary of state, and it would be a big issue. Should it go to parliament? Uh, well, you could argue it should. Um, I don't, what's your view? I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't object to it going to parliament. Where it happens, it's a very big question. It shouldn't be a confidential thing particularly. If, if it's to such an extent the permanent secretary thinks an impropriety has taken place, the fact that there maybe should be a committee such as this ex examining it, I can see a good case for that, actually. Um, but it, it, it happens very rarely in my experience. Uh, but it's the right of the Permanent Secretary, and I would say the duty of the Permanent Secretary, to set out formally if he or she thinks that the Secretary of State is behaving incorrectly. Of course, if there's then uh, something more serious on the, on the propriety side, a breach of the Ministerial Code, for example, that is something which would absolutely need to be brought to the attention of the Prime Minister of the day and to the um, Secretary of the Cabinet, but there may be proprieties that, that, that don't um, arise. I mean, one of the most difficult areas I found was relationships with private contractors. Uh, I've just come this morning from a breakfast downstairs on educational technology, and when I first became a junior minister in this area in 1998, I thought it was very important to try and understand what companies like Microsoft or Apple or whatever were doing in the educational field. But I was advised I couldn't meet them because there might be a circumstance in which there might be a tender coming round the corner where it might, the meeting might be thought to have prejudiced uh, a decision on the allocation of the contract. And it was a very long and difficult process and actually it meant there was a lack of dialogue in areas which I thought were really quite important. And it, I still think this is quite a difficult problem. I think there's a kind of um, purity, I don't say that's a funny word to use perhaps, but a, a kind of isolation of the political class and the civil servant class from what's going on in the rest of the world, which I think is a problem. And you end up with ridiculous and dangerous situations that the meetings that take place take place at think tank dinners or functions or uh, private meetings, which is in fact not, uh, which is not about allocating money from the government, which obviously would be improper, but about trying to understand what's going on in these different areas. And I think there is a, it's in fact important to get a better level of dialogue between government in, the, in general and the wider world than we currently have, and some of the current conventions make that quite difficult to achieve. On, and I know Le Cricard wants to take this up. He may want another point beforehand, which you mentioned, um, Mr. Clark and Lord Panic, about the relationship perhaps between the civil servants at senior level and Parliament, if the permanent secretary were to alert Parliament. Um, Lord Cricard, I know you wanted to pursue that, but did you have another point as well you wanted to make on this? Yeah, I just wanted to take up a point that, rather interestingly, Lord Clark has raised, um, and it takes us back to a point made uh, earlier. Uh, by Michael Howard about the difference between accountability and responsibility. I was chairman of an IT service company attempting a very important contract for the cabinet office at the heart of government, and uh, the, uh, which had largely been subcontracted out the management of it. I doubt if the minister had any real knowledge of what was going on at all. 
it was in the hands of the second permanent secretary. And when things started to go wrong, I, as chairman of the company, suggested a meeting with the second permanent secretary, which is what would have happened in the private sector, yes. because it takes two to tango. Yes. He refused to have that meeting until everything was lost. And then what happens is that, mysteriously, the whole thing disappeared into... We never heard anything more about it. I don't think it ever got looked at by the Public Accounts Committee. And you have the Permanent Secretary reporting to the Public Accounts Committee about accounting matters, but uh, it, the Civil Service reporting is always going to be defensive of the Civil Service position when something has gone wrong of an administrative kind, like the management of an IT contract. Mm. Uh, how do we get round that the minister cannot be responsible for this? I don't even see how he can be accountable <coughs> for this. And are we adequately looking at how we deal with just this sort of situation? I think this is a massive issue, Lord Prickow. I, I, I mean, Baron Stray will correct me. I don't, I'm not sure it's a matter this committee is looking into, but I think it's an absolutely enormous question. One of the biggest contracts I saw was as the Minister of State at the Home Office when Jack Straw was Home Secretary uh, of the uh, communication system to the police, which was a contract with BT. And it was a massively difficult question, finally resolved by the Permanent Secretary Sir David Oman and the, and the uh, Home Secretary Jack Straw with my involvement on Christmas Eve one year. There had been enormous negotiation, as you say, in ways that people found very difficult to understand and actually the government was a very bad partner for the private sector in its negotiation of those issues. And I was going to say millions, certainly hundreds of millions of pounds have been lost by bad decisions in these areas precisely because there isn't sufficient level of dialogue between the contractors and government because it's thought to be improper. Now, obviously one's got to be frightened of impropriety in this area because there is potential corruption that could always be there. I don't think this has in fact been the case in these areas but it is potentially there, but you've got to have a better system of dialogue between the government and the people it's contracting with. And you're Having been a minister in the Department of Health at the time of trying to establish an NHS IT system, mm. I'm very familiar with this, but I think if we may move on quickly to the broader question of the civil service and their relationship with Parliament per se, did you, I think you wanted to pursue that yourself. Uh, no, it was really on this. It was it, specifically it was, it on that. Well, except that it... it the point I referred to, Michael Howard's reference, it is the responsibility and answerability to Parliament of just this kind of situation, well, it is. which and I find very difficult to see how it works in practice. I think this is where I think we, we really do need change. Mm. Although I think change is beginning to happen, um, and you were given an example of it in um, your previous hearing of a permanent secretary being asked to account for something that had happened in a previous department um, mm. where she had served. And I think um, that is, it's not easy, um, but that is the best answer to the kind of difficulty that Lord Quickhile has raised. I mean, if, if you, it, it's essentially, I think, a matter for the Public Accounts Committee, and the Public Accounts Committee is um, moving in this direction and is now n refusing to accept what had previously been regarded as the kind of blanket convention that you, um, you had the permanent secretary in the Home Office, if it was a Home Office project, um, and if that was a new permanent secretary and all the decisions had been taken by someone else, well, that was tough. Um, this was the permanent secretary you had in front of you and this was the permanent secretary you had to be content with. That is changing, and I think that is an extremely healthy change because the way to stop things falling into the hole which Lord Crick Howell described, which has so often been the case in the past and which is the real enemy of accountability, is for bodies like the Public Accounts Committee and, and indeed principally the Public Accounts Committee to be able to question the people who were in charge of making the relevant decisions yes. at the relevant yeah. time, yeah. even if they have now moved on, even indeed if they've retired. They should, be, um, they should be accountable in that real sense of that word yeah. for the decisions which they took. Long I strongly agree with you. Mm. I mean, as you said, I think that happened in one um, well-known case. I, mean, I wonder why we don't move to a more 
um, direct accountability model for civil servants anyway. I mean, the, the, of course, permanent secretaries sometimes to their distaste appear in front of the um, Public Accounts Committee, but they also appear increasingly in front of other committees. I mean, I myself in appeared in front of many parliamentary committees, not just the Public Accounts Committee, the Home Affairs Select Committee, the Justice Committee, the Constitution Affairs um, Committee. It, 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 it seems to me in the, in the case of um, policy implementation as opposed to policy development, there can't be any real objection, can there, to Parliament wanting to scrutinise directly those individuals who have made decisions, particularly if the decisions have gone wrong, not just in financial terms, but in, in terms of the government's objectives. And what, what is the, what, what's the problem with, a, with a, a, a broader and deeper form of direct accountability to Parliament by civil servants, senior civil servants, I mean? Well, I think, it's, I think again, there's a distinction to be drawn between policy matters I agree. for which really ministers must be responsible and accountable it's their, it's, that's their bag and implementation now ministers have a responsibility for making sure that implementation takes place as well it's no, you know it's no, no effective minister would simply say this is the policy, get on with it and uh, I'm not going to ask you anything more about it for another year that's, uh, you know, that, 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 that's not the way effective government is conducted so ministers have a role in implementation as well but where you have a project of the kind that we were just discussing a, 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 an IT project or something of that kind or the um, regional fire service project which um, again you were discussing on your previous hearing so on matters of that kind then um, I, I, I don't see um, any difficulty in um, select committees even apart from the Public Accounts Committee which I think has the primary role um, asking to see the people who were responsible for the decisions that were actually made and indeed they increasingly do yeah they, they, it's increasingly um, happening I mean is, 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 the, the, the objection that's usually made to this process is, is politicisation that, that it somehow politicises the civil service do you have any sympathy with that view Mr Clark? I don't. I mean, I'm not sure there's an, there's an obstacle to what you're suggesting in any case. I mean, I argue for a much more rigorous approach. When I was a member of the Treasury Select Committee in 1997-98, I proposed, and it was agreed, that we have a programme for a parliament for a four-year period. It's now going to be more easy with a fixed-term parliament approach of having a formal inquiry into each of the organisations for which the Treasury was responsible, including the Treasury itself, Bank of England, and so on. And I think all, all select committees ought to have a programme where they routinely is a process of scrutinising each of the agencies in that area. Um, it takes a lot of work and involves a lot of people, but I believe that that kind of level of scrutiny every three or four years is important for every public body, uh, and there should be a process of going through it. It would mean staffing up the select committees a bit more to be able to do the work that was involved in it, and it certainly would involve what you're suggesting, the ability to take evidence from civil servants and people who indeed aren't even civil servants who are responsible for the operation of the various agencies in different ways. Uh, and I absolutely think that should be possible. I don't think that's politicisation in any way. Uh, if they're asked a difficult question in the policy field, uh, the civil servant would simply say, well, that was a matter of policy. And ministers decided to go in that way. And that's the answer that the committee, select committee would get. And fair enough. But, Durman, to, sorry, to sorry, give, but to sorry, give that sorry. answer wouldn't of itself be a problem. Lord Erling. Uh, uh, this is a question that I'm really putting to both of you in, in, in no particular order. Does it uh, follow from uh, what has just been said that both, both of you uh, really think that select committees should be entitled and recognised as entitled, perhaps by a new convention, uh, to question uh, uh, civil servants on the detail of implementation of a policy, uh, particularly perhaps where the implementation of the policy uh, cuts across changes of administration. Personally, I'd, be, I'd welcome that. I think the, so that it would be an appropriate strengthening of the select committee process to do it. My only caution is the amount of time involved in these hearings is substantial, and getting the agreement of select committee members to allocate the amount of time involved in what would then be a very heavy set of uh, inquiries uh, could be difficult. 
But for me, it's an absolutely classic appropriate role for a Member of Parliament and an honourable role and one that should be fulfilled. But as I said earlier, I think it would require a little more staffing up of the select committee process. I'm not talking about going to the level of the support for the Public Accounts Committee, but the main select committees would need a bit more research support to help them well, it would understand. Be, it would be hard work, but they'd need more support. Yes, precisely. My well, I, I agree. Um, with this qualification, Lord Irvin's question was um, in relation to decisions taken by a previous administration. No, well, that the new convention would... Uh, uh, entitle uh, members of select committees to ask questions about the implementation of policy set out or determined by a previous administration when continued by a subsequent administration. Yes, well, I mean, there are sensitivities, as we all know, about the extent to which um, new ministers have access to papers and the ministers of previous administrations yes, and so on. So I think um, when it, I mean, in general, as I made clear earlier, I'm entirely in favour of, of the principle, but I think it would have to be handled with special sensitivity when there's been a change of administration as opposed to simply a change of personnel um, within the same administration. Now that was why I was careful to qualify it by premising uh, that it would be a continuation of policy mm -hmm. Uh, from one administration uh, to another uh, in circumstances where the select committee was addressing the success throughout of implementation. Mm -hmm. Well, in principle, yes. Uh, sorry, Lord <coughs> MacDonald, I think I interrupted you. You wanted yes. something else. I was just going to, 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 to see if, 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 if this can be taken a stage further. Bernard Jenkin has suggested that prospective permanent secretaries should be subject to... Um, some form of pre-appointment hearings by common select committees. Now, this is already happening, isn't it, for some <coughs> posts, um, and seems to be working, not, not permanent secretary posts, but from some other public posts, seem to be working reasonably well. I wonder whether any of you think that that's a desirable development, or whether it would be a step too far. I would oppose that for permanent secretaries. I think the permanent secretaries are the servants um, of the whole government and that should be appointed in a way that operates as now. I strongly supported the um, confirmation hearings for a number of agencies. In fact, the Treasury Select Committee I mentioned earlier voted in favour of confirmation hearings for the Government of the Bank of England, and we ended up in the rather embarrassing position that the then Government, uh, led un under Gordon Brown as Chancellor, wasn't in favour of doing that in 1998. And so Giles Radice and I uh, had to abstain against our own Government on our own, because our own recommendation was taken up by the Opposition. I'm in favour of extending those confirmation hearings in a key number of posts, uh, things like Head of Ofsted and so on and so forth, but I wouldn't favour that going to permanent secretaries. Because I think sorry, I'm not quite following the distinction between those posts and the permanent secretary posts. I think they're qualitatively different posts. Yeah. I think you have a professional civil service, of which the permanent secretary yeah. is the yeah. peak of the professional civil service. And uh, in general, the appointments to the permanent secretary role are made by the civil service on the basis of the competence of yep. the candidates, not on the basis of direct political intervention in any kind of way. Whereas when you're appointing uh, a governor of the Bank of England or a chairman of the BBC or whatever, it's a different type of process where I think I, I personally would go f further uh, than saying just holding confirmation hearings. I think there should be a formal confirmation, as in the American example. And I think I would qualify your question to some extent. I think there are some serious constitutional issues which are lying under the surface at the moment about the role of select committees in some of those appointments as decisions are taken and uh, then Secretaries of State overrule that. There was a, there was a recent case, uh, who was it, the offer, the head of the Office of Fair Access, where there was controversy. Um, and I think there needs to be more clarity than there is now about the rights of a select committee in those circumstances. Is it simply to advise the Secretary of State or is it actually to formally confirm an appointment? I broadly favour formally confirming an appointment but I raise it in the way I do, Lord Macdonald, because I'm, I don't think you can say, as you did say, that the current system's working reasonably well. I think there are a number of issues under the surface which will come out at some point where the responsibilities aren't quite clear. Except that I would favour a continuation of what I think is an advisory role rather than formal confirmation. I agree with everything that Charles has said. I, mean, I should say, Lady Jane, 
There were issues. I gave evidence to the Treasury and Civil Service Select Committee in 1992 about the involvement of the Leader of the Opposition in key appointments. I, at that time, was working for Neil Kinnock as Leader of the Opposition. And there was an interesting issue immediately before the 92 election about consultation, both on the appointment of the Lord Chief Justice with the Leader of the Opposition and on the appointment of the Permanent Secretary to the Treasury with John Smith, who was then the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer. And there was an uncodified issue about to what extent the opposition should be involved in key... The opposition, I emphasise, as opposed to Parliament, in key appointments of that kind. And I, my evidence to the Treasury and Civil Service Select Committee in about 1992, which I can let the committee have if it's uh, of interest, uh, said that I think this needs to be codified because there's a serious issue about mm -hmm. to what extent, in relation to certain points, the opposition should be involved in the process. Well, I can't um, l let this session end without turning to the question of special advisers and their role with the civil, with the civil service and with Parliament. Lord Hart. Um, An distinguished ex-member of this group. Yes, in, in National in Union of Public <laughs> Special Advisers. In the limited time we've got, can you uh, uh, deal with just three questions? First of all, can you tell us whether, uh, in your view, the role and influence of special advisers has changed over the last 20 years? Secondly, in the light of recent uh, uh, actions in relation to the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, do you think that ministers and permanent secretaries are able adequately to control and be held accountable for the actions of special advisers? And thirdly, do you think that there's um, uh, room or scope for increasing the accountability of special advisers to Parliament? Well, my own answer to this would be that um, the role of special advisers has changed over time. Uh, they vary immensely in terms of the type of person they are. Some are glorified press officers. Others are serious political advisers across a wide range. They're simply different types of people, play different types of role. I think they're, I'm, I'm of the school which believes there are too many special advisers. Uh, some of the issues under our government at the centre were not correctly handled. I don't think the issue about giving... Uh, certain special advisers' line management responsibility over civil servants was correctly dealt with in 1997. I don't think we should have done that. Um, I think defining how the level of influence has changed would be difficult, but uh, I think it certainly has changed. Are ministers able adequately to control and be held accountable for their special advisers? I'd say absolutely certainly yes. The special advisor is the servant of, the slave of, almost, the Minister and Secretary of State. I find it absolutely incomprehensible in the case that you mentioned of the current Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, that he could be thought of as different to his special advisor. Any communication by the special advisor is a communication by the Secretary of State, uh, and, that, and it needs to be treated as such. And the suggestion of some difference between them, I think, is absolutely absurd. And I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's absolutely uh, wrong. Uh, that the Prime Minister has acted accordingly in the case of that particular area. The idea that the uh, Special Advisor can operate independently of the Secretary of State I think is quite wrong. If they were operating independently, then they should have been sacked on the spot at the time. Uh, mistakes can be made and they then can be corrected. Uh, I extend that to the point you ask about accountability to Parliament. I don't think Special Advisors should have any accountability to par Parliament. They don't exist other than as um, the voice of their principal. Uh, I did this role for many years for the Leader of the Opposition, for Neil Kinnock, uh, and I was acutely aware that everybody treated me as though I was speaking on behalf of the Leader of the Labour Party, the Leader of the Opposition, and that is what was the case. When I became a Cabinet member, I expected my special advisers to be seen to be speaking on my behalf, and if they said something which was not reflecting my position, that was a matter that had to be sorted out between me and the special advisor. There was never any issue about any problem or difficulty in doing that. So uh, I think they are able adequately to control their special advisors. If they aren't, then they shouldn't be in the job. And I think they should be held accountable. The ministers should be held accountable for what their special advisors do. I'm sure when you were a special advisor, uh, you operated in precisely that way in respect to your principal. Well, I certainly agree with Charles that what was done in 1997, making um, civil servants accountable to people who were in effect special advisors, was a great mistake. And it had a knock-on effect. Uh, 
on the role played by special advisers within departments. Um, it was a mistake that was actually rectified by Gordon Brown, um, and I hope that's not a mistake that is um, ever repeated. Um, but special advisers do have, I think, an important role. And I know we're near the end, and, and, and time is short. Charles said he thought that there were too many special advisers, and that's a common refrain. Um, let me give you an example of one area of a cabinet member's responsibility which it is very difficult for him or her to undertake and where they could be significantly helped by the presence of an additional special advisor, quite apart from someone who's giving advice on the policy of their own department. I found it very difficult when I was in government to make an effective contribution to decisions which were made by other departments. There were some in which I took a particular interest and so I devoted quite a lot of time to them. I simply didn't have the time to do that across the board. And in retrospect, if I think back to things I would have liked to have done differently when I was in government, I would really have liked to have a special advisor looking not at what I was doing in my department, but looking at what other departments were doing so that I could have made a much greater input, for better or for worse, into those decisions for which I would have to bear collective responsibility than I was in fact able to make. Now that would lead to an increase in the number of special advisors. Um, and I think um, that's, um, that's one reason why I, I don't go along with that. I don't think special advisors should be um, answerable to Parliament um, for the reasons that Charles gave. Just to come in very quickly, I, I agree with that point, and my point is not about too many special advisors for individual cabinet members. I think one or two or even three might be acceptable in that area. But you have some, if you look at all the list of special advisors, there's some big agglomerations. There were around the Treasury, uh, certainly around number 10, and so on. And I think that should be a rather smaller number. Well, you've both been enormously generous with your time and with your extremely helpful comments. So I don't know if there are any points you, either of you feel we've not touched on that you particularly wanted to bring to the attention of the committee. No, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's been enormously valuable. Thank you. Very grateful to you both.